question him just because they find him interesting. He once counted to infinity twice. His picture is worth a billion worlds. He is both left-handed and right-handed. It only takes him 20 minutes to like 60 minutes. He can't judge a book by its color. He uses the last resource instead of by sea. He can speak brave. He once beat up the man who invented books. He once overthrew a third world dictator by making a single phone call. His barbecue ribs are so good, he was given a Nobel Peace Prize. People come from miles around just to watch his beard grow. He was turned down for the league of food and blue because he was too cool. He never asked for directions because he has never lost. He had to walk to school, appear both ways in the snow, airport. There is no roof in his shower. He uses an escort. He has had a full-time job since he was born. He is not afraid of the dark. The dark is afraid of him. His favorite food is steak. Sometimes he even cooks it. He won the Pulitzer for a grocery list. He scribbled out on a map. He once was named Man of the Year on January 8th. He does not lift weights. He cannot find any that are heavy. He knows what to do with a clone. He is the most amazing man alive. He is your father. Happy Father's Day, my friends. Happy Father's Day, my friends. Indeed. Hope you know what to do with a Klondike bar. Let's uh, stand together and sing praises to our Father, which is in heaven. Hope you are cool enough to get turned down for the part of Cool Hand Luke. And it is good to be a Christian today. And I uh, hope you've had a great week this week. Hope you had a good Father's Day so far. So let's raise a hallelujah this morning. Hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. I raise Hallelujah. 
See?
Amen and amen. Happy Father's Day. And, uh, it's a blessing to have. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it is your one great blessing in this world to know the Lord and have everything else flow from that. And I kind of want to give you a, a thought from that this morning. From Matthew chapter number 1 and verse number 1. Uh, this is something that, that really just caught my attention this week. There are a lot of examples of, of great fathers in the world and especially in Scripture. A lot of examples of, of great fathers and how to be a great father. But this kind of really caught my attention this last week and I've never, never really thought about it in depth before. Um, but Matthew chapter number 1 Verse number one says this, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. So Matthew is written to Jewish believers and, and, and from, a, from the perspective of a Jewish believer to, to give people evidence that Jesus Christ was God. Okay. And so uh, this is the generation. This is going to give you the generation the genealogy, boy, we as believers, when we're reading through our Bible, we love reading through the genealogy, don't we? My wife will say, my wife and I both use the same computer as we're reading through Scripture, so we read differently. Um, I read in one place, and then I come to the computer, and then I look up some verses. My wife reads the Bible on the computer, but she noticed the other day that we're both reading through First Chronicles. And she was like, oh, the Chronicles. And uh, because if you read through Chronicles, a lot of names in there, which, uh, if you, like myself, are honest, or you, unlike myself, are just really smart, you, you know all the names, you can pronounce all the names. If you don't, you just, like me, slur them as you're reading the group. So, but there's just name after name after name. One of the things I get from that is God is interested in individuals. Now, that's an important thing. But here in Matthew chapter 1, in verse number 1, you get the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The record of the people that go from, from, from the beginning to, to Jesus Christ. To show you that Jesus Christ is God. But listen to what Jesus, uh, Matthew chapter number 1 verse number 1 says. The book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of anybody read number David. Jesus Christ, if I were, if I were before that said, Jesus Christ, the son of most people, God, Mother, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Matthew says, I'll give you the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Son of David. You ever wondered why the Bible calls Jesus Christ the Son of David? Here's a, in, in other words, the genealogy in the book of Matthew says, this is how it's how it started. How in the world, look, I've known some dads with some juice. Okay, some dads who in my mind, I mean, that's a dad right there. But I remember one time my, my brother had a friend over. My dad has always just in my mind been, just had a presence. And his mother said, um, Nathan, it's time to go. And Nathan said, I don't want to go. And she said, it's time to go. I mean it, get in the car. It was about five minutes with this. Get in the car, and I'll tell you again. I'll tell you again. I'll tell you again. She said, I'm, I'm, if you don't get in the car, I'm going to leave you. This lady literally got in the car and left. Went down the road, turned around, and came back two times. Well, my dad came out the second time and saw this going on. Walks out there to Nathan and bends over, <laughs> says something in Nathan's ear. And then when his mama drives up, <laughs> he jumped in the car. Of course, I had to know. And I just told him, you don't get in that car when your mama pulls up there. I'm going to wear your tail out. When, and then when he, she got in the car, she said, it works every time. <laughs> I was just like, yeah. What happened is, <laughs> this dude felt the presence of a father with some juice. But you want to talk about a dad with, with, with some presence. Jesus Christ, if you 
are in the genealogy of Jesus Christ way back gene generations and generations your name was there and you get the bump to people trying to prove that, that Jesus is God and it reads like this, Jesus the son of David. There's something that has gone on in your life that is unique that we should probably all gain a little bit of, we should glean a little bit of information from. This is the kind of father that we should, we should long to be, try to be, try to mirror ourselves after. Because guys like to do things that are impressive. The reason that Father's Day, and we have a good crowd, we have a good crowd this morning, we have a good crowd here today, but it's not like Mother's Day, is it? I mean, your favorite Mexican food restaurant is not as crowded on Father's Day as it is on Mother's Day. I mean, we'll just be honest about that. Why? Because church is not as crowded on Father's Day as it is on Mother's Day. Why not? Because guys per capita don't go to church as much as women. Why not? Glad you asked. Because guys like to do things they think they can do well. And they'll do weird stuff to, to do it. Right? Um, Bro Scott, got anything in your pocket today? Yes, sir. What? Eisenhower dollar? I bet you do. <laughs> I knew you'd take it out for me. There you go, stand up, take it out. Everybody watch God. Make it fall up. Did y'all see that? You may be too far to see it. Da da. Okay, sit down. <laughs> now, he, he takes out his hot dog, he put it in his hand, and he make it fall up. Okay? Now, Russ Scott, we're having the, um, uh, he'll announce here in a little bit, for the Orr City Ministry Alliance, we're having a banquet to raise money for Orr City Ministry Alliance, and uh, would like if you could to, to uh, bring some things to, uh, to auction off and, and that kind of stuff. He's going to do a magic show. We have uh, only 10 tickets, only 8 left um, <laughs> that are available. In two, two services, we have 8 tickets to offer you. Um, no, 3 tickets. Okay, 3 tickets left. Uh, uh, don't, go, don't rush to the back. We don't need that. Uh, but anyway, um, just help and support if you can. But Brother Scott is going to do a magic show. Okay? This guy practices making an Eisenhower dollar fall up. I don't know why. <laughs> and you guys don't need to laugh too much. Because some of you, your prize thing is your grasp. You cut grass, going to grow tomorrow. You'll cut your grass and put fertilizer on it. This is fine. Because why? You want to do it, you want to do it well. You want your neighbor to step out and go like, wow. Right? Maybe it's your garden. That's just a God thing, man. That's what God do. Every guy in here got something. Go to the gym. The average person in the gym is just this guy picking heavy stuff up. <laughs> right? It's a weird thing. Guys will find something to do that they can do well. We as, as fathers, the, the, when we don't feel like we're doing it well, we'll stop doing it. It's called passive aggression. And that's why so many don't do church. But I want today to give you this picture of a father's heart. A guaranteed win. This guaranteed win. What made David unique? What made David to where he could just jump up here to the to this Jesus, son of David? I want to give you just a couple um, couple things as far as um, uh, like an introduction, and then then uh, three real quick points. First of all, I want you to notice that uh, that something happened with David where he jumped three places in the order of birthright. In other words, David wasn't from the tribe. This covenant that God had given was, you, you've heard, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. It wasn't in this order of birthright in Isaac's family to where it was like the firstborn child. Like he was, David wasn't from the, from the tribe of the firstborn even. 
He wasn't from, from the tribe of, of, of Reuben. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Chronicles. Like I said, I've just been reading through Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse number 1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as, as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, who, by the way, was not the second in line. That would have been Simeon. And Judah, by the way, was not the third. That would have been Levi. Judah was the fourth in line. But the Bible says that the, that the birthright ended up going to Joseph, the son of Israel. And the genealogy, because clearly genealogies here were important. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. For Judah prevailed above his brethren. Now, why? What would cause you to prevail? What would cause you to do something well? What is it that made the difference? For example, in Judah, in David, for example. And of him came the chief ruler. Who's the chief ruler? But the birthright was Joseph's. The chief ruler ended up being David, but the birthright ended up being Joseph's. We see the chief ruler coming out of Judah. So, David ends up jumping in order of birthright. We see also that David received this covenant, this covenant promise that the Messiah would come out of whatever David did, whatever was going on in David's life, whatever kind of person David was, the response was, God said, I'm going to give you this covenant promise that not only your son is going to be king, not only that your son's son is going to be king, but you are going to have this line of kings that's going to end with a king that is going to be king of kings, eternal king. 2 Samuel chapter number 7 and verse number 12 says it like this. And when the days were fulfilled that thou, uh, that thou shalt sleep with your fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? Forever. This Davidic covenant, this eternal covenant of I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you someone that's going to come out of your line that is going to establish an eternal kingdom forever. This known as the Davidic covenant is this covenant that says one day there's going to be a Messiah, an eternal king, who's going to set up an eternal kingdom. I'm going to give you that promise, David. Something in David prompted God to give him eternal covenant. Not only that, even people in the New Testament call Jesus son of David. Not because he was in the genealogy of Matthew. This was written after Jesus' life. But the people during Jesus' life, when they saw Jesus, they were like, oh, hey. When they recognized him as Messiah, as the fulfilled prophecy of that king coming, they called him Jesus, son of David. Why? Because they understood that what they were saying, this is why the Pharisees were so upset when they heard that. When someone was sick and on the roadside, for example, we gave you a lot of verses if you're looking at um, the PowerPoint or on the U version. Uh, you can look up the verses. You can see the verses. But Matthew, just give you one example. Matthew 20, verse number 30. The Bible says, And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard the Jews uh, that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. You remember in the book of Luke where, where uh, Barnabas, Barnabas uh, said, uh, Jesus, thou son of David. Have mercy on me. When Jesus, uh, during, the, um, during the ride from the Mount of Olives up to that east gate of Jerusalem, when they were laying down palm leaves on Palm Sunday, and they were saying, they didn't just say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In Matthew chapter number 21, verse number 9, they said, Hosanna, son of David. That's why the Pharisees said, Tell those people to stop doing that. Because they're saying, you're the king that has come to reign forever. That you're the fulfillment. 
the Davidic promise of a father who once lived in the Old Testament. Tell them to stop saying you're the son of David. Don't let them do that. And they were saying, Hosanna, son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the was saying, oh, the was like, ooh, woo, woo. That's blasphemy. Was it blasphemy? Because Jesus fulfilled that Davidic covenant. In Matthew chapter number 2, verse number 1 and 2, you see that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. When the wise men came, they said, where is he who is born king of the Jews? Where is he who is born king of the Jews? In the inception of the early church in Acts chapter number 13, verse number 22, um, Paul here writes, he says, and when he had removed him, that is, when Saul was removed, then he raised up David to be their king, in whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill my will. Of this man's seed, that is David's seed, hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, comma, who? Jesus. He said, when Saul, when I took Saul down, I raised David up, and I promised him that I would raise up an eternal seed, an eternal king to him, and that's exactly what I did, and that person is here, and that person is Jesus. Jesus fulfilled the Davidic covenant. So, Brother Tony, you killed me with all the history stuff. I promise you, we're going somewhere. Jesus fulfilled that Davidic covenant. And the last thing, by way of introduction, the three points are very short, so it's okay. I just want you to understand this that whatever David did, that put him in the position that he was in. Put him in the position to be modeled for future generations. In 2 Kings chapter 14, 2, uh, 1 Kings chapter 15, 1 and 3, and uh, uh, 1 Kings 16, 2. Let's just read one of them. Uh, 1 Kings 16, 2. The Bible says, 20 years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father. Through 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 2 Samuel, um, um, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Second Chronicles, you see king after king after king who one of them would say, and this king did right in the sight of the Lord, but not like David did right. This king did wrong. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Unlike David, whatever David did, to, to, to put himself in the position before God to be called the, 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 the Jesus Father. Whatever he did also put him in a position to be modeled throughout the generations after him. In other words, when they said this person did right, how they, how they kind of measured it was how David did it. This king did evil inside the Lord like David. For example, Josiah, the last king, the Bible says he did right more than any other king. And you know how he did it? Anybody want to guess? Like David. This guy did right. He, was, he, he, did, he did more right stuff, more than any other king, Josiah, even more than David. But he did it, the Bible says, like David did it. What was it? What, how can I be that kind of father? How can I be the kind of father? By the way, let me say this. It wasn't because, uh, because David was some kind of superhero. We love guys that win. That's why I say guys find a way to win. It doesn't matter what it is. We'll figure out some way to win in something. That is just a, an ego-driven God thing. How God created us. I just want to encourage you with this. And nobody would say David was a slouch. 
But I will tell you this, it's not because David's life was always at rest and always at peace. David was anointed king, and almost immediately Saul started looking for him to kill him. About a quarter of David's life was spent running from Saul. Saul gets killed, and David's like, all right, I'm king. Whew, fine. Well, part of the time that Saul was looking for David, David was living with the Philistines, the enemy of Israel. So when David was set up as king, the Philistines said, wait, what? Who's king? David? Mm -mm, we're not letting that happen. We're going to go fight Israel. From that time on, from the very beginning of David's reign, it was one of the most, one of the most difficult reigns as far as wars, which is why so many of the Psalms refer to, Lord, help me with my enemies. Because David had enemy after enemy after enemy. But God had given him um, uh, conquest. And God had given him control and power over his enemy. And, God, and so a lot of what David does is praises God for how that God had given him, him power over his enemies. But then David falls into uh, to sin. Remember the, the, the adultery and the murder of Uriah the Hittite? Then the end of David's reign is this coup and this uh, family turmoil and, and, and kingdom turmoil, the entire reign of David. However, what happened with David, the reason David's such a great king, that so great that he could be used as an example, so great that, um, that his name is mentioned in the beginning of the genealogy of Jesus Christ as his father. And this is what I want you to get. What was the difference? What's the difference in a father who is an ultimate winner and an ultimate loser? The heart of God. This was what made the difference in David's life. Not that he had ultimate peace. Not that he did everything right. You see David making some bonehead decisions every time. Something happens in David's life. What does he do? He turns his eyes to the one who he's modeled his heart after. It is heart direction, friend. It is where his heart is turned. It is what his heart is after. It is what his heart is pursuing in this world that calls God to say, I'm going to take David's life and I'm going to make something out of it. You know, make a, a difference in your kid's life? You say, you know, Brother Tony's always talking about how strict his dad was. The answer must be, I just need to be strict. Mm -mm. I know people and their kids turned out good because uh, they were smart. I just need to make my kids smart. Not the answer. I know people, their kids turned out right because um, uh, their family's good and, and this is what he looks like in his life. I'll just do that. And I'll just do it really hard. And when it don't work, I'll do it harder. I went fishing one time with a guy. We fished for about two days and didn't catch anything. We were talking about it at the motel that night, what we are going to do the next day. And here was his advice. All I know to do is keep doing what ain't been working. I'm not sure I like that. Keep doing what hadn't been working. Listen to what 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse number 14 says. Saul, the man who was king before David. Listen, you can put this in your workplace. You can put this in terms of your, your home. You can put this in, place in, your, in your church. And certainly we want to apply this to fatherhood in your personal lives. How do things in this life work? The prophet is giving Saul a message from God. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. This was why David was picked. This is why David was given covenant. This is why David was used as a standard throughout his generations, throughout his posterity. This is why David's name is mentioned. Jesus' son. 
son of David. That is just, that, as I thought, was thinking about that this way, it just blew my mind. Jesus, the son of David? Only because God stepped in and said, I'm going to do something with your life. Why would God do something with somebody's life? Because his heart was modeled after the heart of God. His life was modeled after the heart of God. And that gives God opportunity to say, now I can take your life and I can do something incredible with it. The other option say, oh, I'll just work hard. I'll just do, do things myself. I'll do great conquests myself. I'll just try harder. I'll keep doing what's not working. <coughs> the Bible says the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people. There are three reasons why a heart for God is so important. It's so important, first of all, because of your personal life. Notice what he tells Saul. He tell, tells Saul, now thy kingdom shall not continue. There's person after person after person in this life who thinks, listen, I got it handled. I got things under control. I know what I'm doing. Saul was one of them. You never hear these words come from Saul. My Lord or my God. Listen, read and see if you ever hear Saul say, my Lord or my God. He's always seeking Samuel's advice for it. Back in that reason, the end of Saul's life, if you'll read in Chronicles, in the end of Saul's life, the Bible says that I rejected you because you never called on me. And what did David do? As soon as David became king, he went and got the ark of God and he brought it back to Israel. What is, what's the significance there? That is the place where God said, I'm going to put my presence there to meet with you. Saul was always trying to meet with God through somebody else. And God said, that's not my plan, bro. I want you to love me personally. I don't want you to go down to a church and try to know me through somebody else. I appreciate that you come to church and that you want to hear a message. I love sharing them. Do you know what Paul said? I, he said, I fed you with milk and not with meat because you weren't able to bear it. You know what milk is? What is milk? Just on an elementary level. Milk is secondhand food. I was at a wedding last night and a lady asked, can I borrow your car? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, what? Can I borrow your car? I need to feed my baby. See, she had, she had eaten food. Her body had processed food. Now she wanted to feed that to her baby. See, I'll read God's word. I'll process God's word. And I'll feed it to you. That's fine. But that's on some level milk. What we as believers do is we get in God's word. We cut something off that cow ourselves. Put that thing on the fire. For you personally. Because you may think you have things under control in your life. But if your heart's not after the Lord, you're trying to do things secondhand like Saul did, not going to work. Also, if you're a Christian life, where is your heart turned? What in life is important to you? The heart of every problem is a problem with the heart. Pause for emphasis. The heart of every problem is a problem with the heart. I want you to think about what Jesus said to Peter before he ascended. Peter, do you love me? Three times. Peter's like, yeah, Lord, you know I love you. Can, can you almost see Jesus? Sitting there by Galilee, pausing. After Peter just kind of, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Peter's just kind of doing whatever he's doing. He's like, Peter, hey, <coughs> do you love me? Uh, maybe I misunderstood the question. Yes, Lord. I love you. 
hidden. There's stuff that I want you to do with me, to do for me. Peter? Peter? Do you love me, Peter? Now Peter's like, wait a minute. There's something else going on here. I didn't misunderstand the question. This is a deeper question. Do you love me? Yes, Lord. You know everything. You know what? What was the whole thing about you know everything? The whole thing about you know everything is, Lord, if there's something I don't know, tell me. Lord, you know everything. If there's something I don't know, let me know. I love you. I would ask today, who do you love? It was a game we used to play with my kids. My kids would love them. My wife and I kind of do that too sometimes. What game? Just one thing. Hey, who do you love? It's intended to stop them where they were and get them focused and just make them answer questions. Hey, who do you love? You? Who? You want? I want to know. I want to hear. I want you to say the words. Be love. It's important for your interpersonal life, for those who will follow you. Because when people see who you love, they think it's important. You know what the Bible says, Dad? The Bible says, those who love father or mother, husband or wife, son or daughter, more than me, not worthy of me. You know what God says? Don't love anybody else in this world more than me. Don't love your kids more than you love me. And we would think to ourselves, oh, that's very narcissistic and prideful of God. No, it's not. What God understands is what love is, where love comes from, and how love works. And David is someone we can we can model ourselves after, we can pattern our, pattern our lives after, men and women alike. Because no way David was strong enough to win all the battles he won and be the person he was on his own. He was only that kind of person because the Lord said he loved the Lord with his heart. He modeled his life after the heart of God. That's why David, even the son that tried to kill him, when his son died, Joab said, if you, don't, if you don't stop doing what you're doing, you're going to lose your kingdom over the son that tried to kill you. He was, he was crying, oh, Absalom, oh, Absalom, would God I had died instead of you? The son who tried to kill him. See David's heart, like the heart of God, saying, the very people who have forsaken me, the very people who turn their back on me, I love you. The largest mausoleum in the cemetery across from the east gate of Jerusalem to this very day belongs to Absalom. As you're going down from Mount of Olives to the city of Jerusalem, it's a huge cemetery on the side of the hill. The largest mausoleum is the one that David built for the son who tried to kill him. That's amazing. Oh, Absalom. And God is crying out to you today. Love me. I love you. I created you. I made all this for you. Where are you? He cried out to Adam. He loves you today. He has a plan for your life today. He has a plan for your kids today. But the plan is not on how well you can raise them. The plan is how, how much you can love him and let him control that situation. He's strong enough to do it. You cannot do it. Your kingdom, Saul, will not last. If you don't believe it, go look at my wall in my, uh, my office. And all my grandfather and great uncle's fishing stuff. Otherwise known as antiques or trash today. Nobody fishes with that junk anymore. Nobody uses a fish-o-meter. Nobody uses those old 
those old lures anymore. You went fishing with me and I used one of them, you'd think I was crazy. I got a can of fish charm in there. You'd be like, not gonna work, man. I know. My, my grandfather, my uncle, they thought that was the most high tech stuff I'd ever seen. Your kingdom will not last. You need to turn your heart and mind over to Christ and let Him do something to your kids. Let Him do something with your name. Let Him do something with your power. So we should stand together. Do you love it? Do you love it? The altar's open. The musicians come.